Uh, congratulations for the nice presentation and I would like to know if there is any question in the room. Hi Alex, can I ask, um, if you have someone post breast cancer who's having a tamoxifen holiday and they have embryos already stored or made using donor eggs, um, why are you doing a three month tamoxifen washout? Why not just go ahead during that three months and put an embryo back? Well, I think that uh, tamoxifen washout has to do also with uh, the risk of uh, malformation uh, if we transfer an embryo during this three month washout. So we need to wait. I think that most of guidelines say three, some are, I think the last one said two month minimum wash up before embryo transfer. So it's not only during uh, egg pickup, but of course after, uh, for embryo transfer, like when you're having uh, high dose vitamin A treatments or you're getting some vaccines, you need to wait for the risk of uh, fetal malformation. Mm -hmm. I guess that uh, the mm, specialist on fetal medicine can answer that question better than me. <laughs> <laughs> I also have a question for Alex. Thank you for this really very, very good uh, presentations. Alex, uh, um, you, you have discussed during your presentation the importance of time to pregnancy, <clears throat> which is, of course, an issue for patients uh, that are under endocrine treatment and have to restart the treatment. But uh, we have uh, you know, another patient population where you don't have such a urgency. Of course, if you have a 48-year-old uh, lady, there is uh, the issue of the two years uh, before, uh, you know, like the nation is not wise anymore. But uh, many patients are uh, still young and they want to go for spontaneous pregnancy. So how do you discriminate uh, the patient that should be referred immediately for ART uh, from the patients that, uh, well, they would like to have a try? Because this is one of the questions that we also have in the positive and uh, in the, in the protocol is not written clearly, but uh, we introduced the, the idea to have uh, a consultation with the fertility specialist uh, after, well, it's written 12 months of uh, trying spontaneously. I usually do nine months. I understand that you, you would do three months. So <laughs> how do you discriminate? Well, of course, uh, young patients are fantastic. I think that we do all agree and 55-year-old uh, patients that are coming for reproductive counseling are uh, terrible. So I think that the first thing is that having young patients opens almost all possibilities. A few weeks ago, Dr. Walker, she's here, just sent us uh, two beautiful case report about patients that were treated for hematological diseases. I think they were leukemias at very um, young age and came, uh, I think from both of them, from Melbourne for reproductive counseling. And uh, well, uh, with their ovarian fa failure and their high FSH levels, they were proposed for uh, exonation program. So they started uh, estrogenic treatment and uh, they, well, one was many years ago, I think f five or eight years ago, the other one is more recent, but for different reasons, they didn't have the chance to come and stop the treatment. And, well, their strategic treatment reduced FSH. They got spontaneous ovulation and spontaneous pregnancy after 10 years of amenorrhea. So, of course, young patients will always surprise us. And I think that young patients have the right to look for spontaneous pregnancy, for if they wish to IUI or for other techniques until they get up, they get up to the egg donation or the embryo donation program because they didn't succeed or because really their FSH or MAH levels are extremely low. But of course, this was a highly focused uh, session on time to delivery in those cases where we really need to go fast. But of course, in young patients, I think that it's fantastic to give them the chance 
for um, spontaneous pregnancy for three, six, nine months, uh, if we do believe that they might uh, achieve a spontaneous pregnancy. So I think there's no hurry in this young patient. I would never tell them to, to, to wait only three months looking for, for spontaneous pregnancy. We have almost all options in those. Even, even, uh, even if they do not achieve a pregnancy during the tamoxifen vacation, after five years, they still have time to go to an embryo donation or uh, embryo adoption program. So uh, the hurry is a relative hurry, and it has to do mainly with achieving a pregnancy with their own eggs. They have plenty of time then going for egg donation or embryo adoption after finishing their five-year tamoxifen treatment if they do not achieve pregnancy during this two-year period. Uh, if I um, remember well to answer your question I, in positive, I think we, if I remember well, we, we uh, recommend to uh, try spontaneous uh, pregnancy for maximum one year, but have consultation uh, after six months mm -hmm. with the specialist. And, and yeah. the time you manage to think of it. Uh, sure. <laughs> Sorry, I have another question for you, Alex. Uh, you presented your uh, series of uh, 51 patients uh, who underwent uh, egg donation after cancer. And uh, mostly they were breast cancer and uh, as expected, I mean, the population is always that kind of population. And you have 36 uh, patients uh, who achieved the pregnancy. Do you have the obstetrical outcome? Because uh, Yes, I didn't have time enough to... Uh, uh, the mean gestation, gestational age was... 38 uh, weeks and I really don't know if it was because of obstetrical reason or medical paranoia so I think that <laughs> no but we need to be true and I, I yeah, guess yeah, yeah. I guess that we need to be realistic once a patient that already went, underwent chemotherapy that we know that they have a risk of myocardiopathy because they underwent had cancer and underwent chemotherapy no one wants uh, preeclampsia or severe problems when the patient already got up to 38 weeks. So if the average is 38, I guess that most of pregnancies are terminated between 39 and 40, and then we get this 11% of preterm uh, delivery, none of them under 35 weeks, so it was not extreme preterm delivery. Here you have included uh, two patients with colorectal cancer and pelvic radiotherapy, one of them had uh, um, fetal death at 20 week, and then get pregnant again and delivered at uh, 38 or 30, no, 37th week. So uh, fetal weight, as the literature is a little bit uh, under uh, standard uh, weights, I think the, the average was just under three kilograms to 1,900 and something. And uh, we didn't collect the data uh, of other um, associated uh, maternal pathologies such as diabetes or hypertension because it's very difficult to get that data from patients that are coming all around the world. So we get most of the information from the fetus, but it was very difficult, especially in some countries where um, it's difficult for the patients to get the original reports, that depends on the country, and it's difficult for us to contact the specialists. We might contact, we have very, it's very easy to contact with the oncology teams. It's very difficult then to contact with the perinatology so that they can send us uh, valid information about uh, pregnancy and delivery. Any other, any other question? I wanted to ask uh, Isabel about this uh, uh, ovarian tissue thawing grafting during tamoxifen. Should would be would it be a problem to do it during tamoxifen treatment, at least to recover hormonal function yeah, in this patient? I think there is no problem to do it during tamoxifen treatment, but actually the restoration uh, in all the cases and it's quite. Uh, seen in all the patients, restoration of ovarian function occur after around five months. Mm -hmm. 
So it's as you have three months of washout, it's not uh, really uh, mandatory to do it long long time before because you may lose uh, time of the ovarian uh, function. Sure. Here. Well, the question is that you're losing, you might be losing time of function, or if you do it too late, you might be months where you have the right yeah, to, to, very to... Soon, but not necessarily... Especially in those patients that yeah. preserved uh, later uh, in life, not uh, during childhood. We're having patients that are calling us uh, to, well, that they're having the grafting mainly to, to get restored the hormonal uh, function. And now that we know that cryo transfer in modified natural cycle or natural cycle seems to give us a lower miscarriage rate and patients yes. do know it, most of them, even if, if we know that we're not going to be able to get a pregnancy with the e their eggs, uh, restoring this uh, endocrine fu function might help us restoring endometrium and uh, implantational rates yeah. in natural yeah. cycle. No? I think this is <laughs> need to have more sure, for sure. Uh, <laughs> proof for that because uh, it's it's an invasive procedure. It's a, it's a, it's a laparoscopy and uh, you you put back some tissue. It's still experimental. So I'm not sure that I will do the technique just to improve the environment, uh, except if there is very uh, important medical reason to do it. But, mm -hmm. but I think we have good uh, hormone replacement therapy uh, with uh, good results. So uh, I'm not sure that I'm ready to do transplantation just to improve the, okay. the hormonal function. And only to restore the hormonal function. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Not yet. <laughs> <laughs> I have another question for Isabel. Uh, you presented your series. It's Extraordinary series, uh, very nice series, and uh, um, you know there is kind of discussion when you retransplant the ovarian tissue, if you just uh, if you should just wait for a spontaneous pregnancy and you have a, a number of spontaneous pregnancy or do ART on those uh, patients that have been uh, retransplanted, how do you decide? And uh, you know, are there parameters? Are there Data. Yeah, actually, in the in the literature, what and what um, there is different uh, uh, option and different uh, attitude from the center. There is some people who do immediately IVF treatment in these patients. Um, actually, I'm not sure that IVF treatment, and it's not proved in the literature at all, that IVF treatment is better than spontaneous pregnancy in these patients. What we do is, of course, to verify the, the tubal permeability during the, during the laparoscopy, uh, to verify the spam. Everything should be um, uh, normal um, uh, to be sure that at the time of ovarian restoration, we can, have, uh, we can try for spontaneous pregnancy. But uh, for the experiment, the experience we have from IVF, because we have done for some of the patients, usually these patients who have uh, a problem with the tubal permeability uh, or, um, or uh, peritoneal site, because they don't have ovary anymore. Uh, so for this uh, patient, I think it's better to do IVF because peritoneal site is not the best uh, site for spontaneous ovulation. Um, the problem is that you get very few eggs, so most of them is uh, a natural modified cycle with uh, one or two eggs, and so it's it's very hard and, and, and difficult to to get the to get the, the embryo and uh, and to transfer them. But so we just wait uh, usually uh, up to one uh, years after ovarian function restoration. Uh, before uh, getting through IVF treatment, and uh, usually we get uh, we go to IVF treatment uh, if we do a second transplantation and it was not working for the first one. Um, but it's for well, all all of the life births we get it from uh, spontaneous pregnancy, and one pregnancy was obtained with uh, IVF treatment, but uh, she miscarried actually. So. Any other question? 
I have a question for the table. Uh, do you con what do you consider about the, pre the fertility preservation in a, se a small cervical adenocarcinoma? You mean about treatment or about uh, then future counseling? Uh, about counseling and about the treatment and mm -hmm. about the radiotherapy. about <laughs> radiotherapy. <laughs> well, of course, in cervix, uh, well, we need to defer cervix carcinoma and cervix adenocarcinoma. Mm -hmm. Depending on the extension, of course, there's not going to be any fertility preservation and we need undergo radical surgery. But uh, of course, uh, in some cases, and in skilled teams that are able to, to do uh, radical trachelectomy and make sure that there is not risk factors that, such as uh, lymphovascular invasion or some other margin infection or positive lymph, lymph nodes in uh, laparoscopic uh, um, lymphadenectomy. Of course, uh, these cases, the main problem, I think, is not, well, treatment. Uh, I'm sure that Dr. Cusido, that was raising hand. No, 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 that, that you, you, did, you, you, did a, a, well. you did a fantastic uh, review a few um, years ago about effectiveness of these uh, radical treatments or modified radical treatments. I think that the main problem is Perinatal outcome yeah. Yeah. and this uh, preventive cervical circlage during the trachelectomy and the nightmare of miscarriages and uh, obstetric complications such as preterm rupture of member membranes, choriamnionitis, and fetal death is the main counseling that we should consider to these patients before offering a modified radical treatment. So I think that the treatment success uh, rates is not the problem. I think that undergoing this and complete treatment links to a high risk pregnancy and sometimes with pelvic radiotherapy that will still worsen the prognosis. So I think that counseling should be focused on pregnancy and maybe, of course, also on uh, safety. But I think that uh, in this case, the fetal medicine unit would be the one who should be talking the most to the patient. What do you think, Sylvia? <laughs> I don't know if the answer is in the fetal medicine unit. I think that the answer is in the oncologist uh, therapy. What is the, the best option for this patient? We know that if this uh, woman get pregnant, it will be a high-risk pregnancy. Always with a tra trachelectomy, has a abdominal circlage, and it will be very difficult. But uh, we, ha we, we cannot um, forget the, the, the way of life of these of, of this women if she decides to, to get pregnant with this uh, condition. If she decides to get pregnant, uh, we will do the best, but with a high risk, but we don't have uh, so uh, we don't have data to or a huge data to uh, to to try to uh, to tell to the patient how many will be how will be the risk of this pregnancy, but as you know. <laughs> It will be a very high risk. Uh, Maite, do you remember the series that you reviewed on Kelo and Janeth? Uh, if there were many deliveries, but most of them preterm and uh, I don't with. Remember, uh, <laughs> I don't remember exactly, but I think that 70% arrived to, to term, but there but was. Without radiotherapy. With, without without radiotherapy. Without radiotherapy, yeah. <laughs> I think that for early cervical cancer, less than two centimeters, uh, trachelectomy it's, uh, it's oncological yeah. safe. Between two and four centimeters, uh, the results are, are, are not as well. Uh, but uh, when you have high risk factors, are uh, lymphovascular space invasion, uh, adenocarcinoma seems not a risk factor. But no. It's, it's <laughs> different. Uh, radiotherapy changed completely the results, and the, for for 
for delivery, there is a risk for preterm mm, delivery, there is a risk for first semester or Miscarriage. second semester loose, and in some cases there are stenosis of the cervix, so so many patients need uh, techniques for to get pregnant because it's spontaneous. That's the, the, night, the nightmare that I was saying. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so it's an, uh, this patient needs a very, very, very uh, important counseling before the strategy. Because, sure. But if they want to be pregnant, it's the only option that it can they be can done. offer. There sure. is no other option. And surrogacy. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, I know, I know. Yeah. <laughs> Any other comment? No more questions? Okay. Well, um, I'm radiation oncology, so in your world. <laughs> so uh, I would like to, to give you some comments about irradiation. After 45 degrees, it is sure that uh, there is not a possibility of fertility preservation. But in other... Uh, tissues of the body as a salivary glands, after 26 degrees, there is serostomia. So probably the doses accepted are lower mm -hmm. than uh, 45 for pregnancy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This is a comment. And the other comment is that, uh, for example, in cervical cancer or in the uh, not in, in radical treatment of uh, inoperable endometrial cancer, do you give your, uh, radiotherapy plus brachytherapy with the doses that you administer inside the uh, uterus? Well, uh, you can believe me, the uterus uh, don't, uh, won't not exist more. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, um, the other thing is that, uh, uh, so uh, you can consider preservation probably not uh, after irradiation and uh, only uh, after irradiation in other malignancies different to endometrial cancer and cervical cancer because in these cases the doses administered are really high. And in the rest of tumors, it depends on the irradiation technique and it depends on the doses administered to the uh, ovarian and uh, to, the, yes. to the uterus. So uh, the best thing uh, we can do is to preserve fertility with a good counseling before treatment in this patient, as you have commented today, and congratulations for this nice meeting, Dr. Garcia, and uh, thank you very much to the attendees. Well, we can go, if you want to, we can go for, for lunch, if there's someone who'd like to, to walk around and see the laboratory facilities, just please give, give, ask us to, 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 to go with you. And I would ask the speakers and chairman to stay on stage just for, for a few pictures. Thank you, all of you, for your attention. <laughs>